This video is meant to be some dense drawing notes to help you really understand and get on one page all the information you need to know about bone anatomy and physiology. So let's start right here. And this is gonna be a, a single bone, let's say like your arm bone, which is called your humerus. So we'll outline that a little bit darker. And on the ends of long bones, there is structure called articular cartilage. So let's draw that in. And there's articular cartilage on each end of the bone. So we'll draw some in on that side and we'll draw some in on this side. And let's label that and explain what articular cartilage is all about. Articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is cartilage at articulating surfaces. And another name for articulating surfaces are joints. So joints, the professional term for joints is articulations. And the reason that articular cartilage is there is to reduce friction when two bones have to move against one another. And they also help absorb shock a little bit. So we have articular cartilage on this side and articular cartilage on the other end as well. Now, these regions of the bone have some different names. Oh, before I forget, I wanna tell you that articular cartilage is an example of connective tissue. Now, each region of the bone has a different name to it. So let's label that. If this is your arm bone, this would be the part that's attached to your shoulder. And that would be called, I guess the, the ends of the bone, let's name those first. So the end of a bone is called an epiphysis epiphysis, and we'll label this one as well, epiphysis. And if this is the part of your arm bone that's attached to your shoulder, this one's called the proximal epiphysis, and that would make this other one the distal epiphysis. So that's the end closer to the body. This is the end further away from the body. And then we call the middle part of a bone here, this is called the diaphysis of the bone. So two epiphyses on either end and a diaphysis in the middle. And this part of the bone is the, this is the external anatomy of the bone. And then if you took a bone and you sawed it in half longitudinally, then you'd get to see that there's a lot going on inside of a bone as well, the internal anatomy. So let's focus on that. Inside of the bone, there is a big old cavity. We're gonna draw that in there like a tube. And that cavity has a name, and it's called the medullary cavity. In anatomy, whenever you see medulla, that's the um, inside part of something. And that cavity in um, adults is filled with yellow bone marrow. So let's color that in yellow. So here's our yellow bone marrow. Let's label that up. yellow bone marrow. The reason that yellow bone marrow is yellow is because it's made of fat. So that's a good um, area to store some fat that can be used for energy. And this type of tissue, as soon as we see fat, that's gonna be a connective tissue for yellow bone marrow. 
Not only is there yellow bone marrow inside of this medullary cavity, but there's blood vessels too. And you know when we have blood vessels, of course we're gonna use the color red because blood is red. And a blood vessel will go in through your bone and be all in this medullary cavity. So let's draw that. And red is our artery color and blue is our vein color. So let's add a beautiful vein to this guy as well. So there's our blood vessels. We can add some articular cartilage to the end. And just to practice that term again, there's some articular cartilage on the proximal epiphysis. And here's some articular cartilage on the distal epiphysis. Inside of the medullary cavity, here there's a lining. So I'm gonna draw that as a layer inside of here. I'll draw it as a green color. And that layer is called the end, so that's inside, and os is bone, and osteum is that inside layer. And there's also a similar layer on the outside. So endosteum is a connective tissue layer on the inside of bone. On the outside of bone, we'd call the same thing here, the periosteum. Also a connective tissue layer, but on the outside of the bone. So that would be all of this here is the periosteum. So let's label it up on this drawing as well. The periosteum is a connective tissue sheath, CT, connective tissue sheath on the outside of the bone. And this is a spot where um, tendons attach muscles to bones by kind of like weaving into the periosteum and ligaments attach bones to each other. All right, so um, on either end of a bone on the inside, there's like another cavity here. So let's draw that in. We'll draw one on this side. And we'll draw one on this side. <clears throat> and this type of bone that's on the end is going to be called spongy bone. So let's kind of draw that in as like a cross hatched kind of thing. And we'll label up this bone. On the um, proximal epiphysis, we've got spongy bone. Bone is a really good example of a connective tissue as well. And spongy bone um, is called spongy because it's filled with all of these spaces. And we call all of these kind of bone structure um, in there, it's called trabeculae. Trabeculae. And trabeculae in spongy bone make this honeycomb type of shape. And the reason why bone needs to be that way is because that makes bone lightweight. So bone is able to provide support, but also able to provide lightweight support because there's some air spaces in there and it's not just solid. One cool thing about spongy bone is that spongy bone can remodel. So if you start doing like a new exercise or um, you go in season for a sport, you're gonna be using your body a different way and your bone can actually remodel to adjust for um, the new stresses that are on your bones. So spongy bone is at both ends of uh, the bone and also spongy bone acts as a site to store red bone marrow so we'll color that in i'll use this maroon kind of brownish type of color for that so let's label this this is red bone marrow
And yellow bone marrow was our site of fat storage, but red bone marrow has a different job. And that job is called hematopoiesis. I hope I spelled that right. That's a tough one. Hematopoiesis is just a fancy word. That's for blood cell formation. So in your red bone marrow, a lot of your blood cells are born there. In contrast to spongy bone, there's another bone type that's around the edges. So all of this white stuff would be um, that type of bone. And that type of bone is called compact bone. And as you've probably guessed, that bone is indeed compact. So it's not filled with those beautiful um, spongy open spaces, but it is still connective tissue. Compact bone is very dense. Compact bone is found in places where your bone uh, is weight bearing. So any part that's gonna have a lot of weight on it, like if this was your femur bone, that would be having to support a lot of weight. And um, compact bone is going to be a site of attachment. So before I was saying how the periosteum is the actual place where things um, attach, but they're gonna attach to the periosteum on compact bone. So what's gonna attach? Muscles are gonna attach to bones via tendons. And bones attach to other bones via ligaments, ligaments. All right, so that's compact bone. Uh, it's dense, weight-bearing, our strongest bone because it's gotta bear that weight and be the site of attachment for muscles to bones and bones to other bones as well. All right, well, let's see. Let me make sure I got everything here. That looks pretty good so far. Now what I wanna do is, this is like our gross anatomy. You could see a lot of this stuff with your eyes and I wanna zoom in to um, how this would look microscopically. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this little section right here and we're gonna explode view that. So this, this last part on the right is just an exploded view of what's happening. So this was our external gross anatomy, internal gross anatomy, and now we've got some microscopic bone anatomy. And um, bone looks really cool under the microscope. So this part right here, just to get our bearings, this is going to be our compact bone. And let's draw a periosteum outside of that. Just to practice that word again. So this is the, the outside connective tissue sheath. Periosteum on the periphery of the bone. Then on the inside here, there's actually a layer of spongy bone. So we'll draw that in there. We'll draw some nice trabeculae happening here. Trabeculae were those honeycombs of spongy bone with those air spaces in between. And then this part then, let's draw this in. This would be our medullary cavity. And normally we'd want to fill this in yellow for the yellow bone marrow that's in there. But we're going to leave it open for right now.
compact bone looks really interesting because it has um, like a, a very distinct structure that kind of looks like uh, if you cut a tree trunk. And so what I wanna do is I wanna draw some small circles in here. Let's put like, I don't know, maybe like six of them. Four, five, six. And how compact bone looks is it has like these rings going around it. So we'll draw those rings. And this one will have some rings. And they kind of run into each other. So see that each one of these things has its own little rings going on like that. And one of these units, let's highlight one of them. One of these units is called an osteon. So an osteon is a structural unit of compact bone. And this inside part here, these circles that we drew first, those are called central canals. And inside of the central canals, there are blood vessels. I'll just abbreviate that as BV for blood vessels. And there's nerves in there as well. So let's draw those. We'll get our red and blue to draw some blood vessels. Let's put an artery in each one of those. I bet you didn't think of your, your bone as having so many blood vessels in it. <clears throat> and here's a vein in each one. And nervous tissue is also drawn as kind of like, a lot of times like a yellowish color. So we'll put that in there too. In each one of those osteons. And there are, so one of these uh, rings here, let's see, where should we label it? Let's label it, let's draw this one in a little better so we know what we're, we're labeling. One of these rings is called a lamella. So there are several lamellae in each um, osteon. And then these rings actually connect to each other by these little like spokes. So we can draw some of those in. Now that's starting to look like some good compact bone there. So one of these here has a funny name, it's called a canal. So they're like little canals. And how we say little, canal iculi, canaliculi, are these tiny channels. To connect lamellae. And so nutrients are able to get around by passing through the lamellae and canaliculi to get all around the bone. And there are some other cells that we need to keep track of as well. So I'm gonna use a yellow color here and bone cells live in these lamellae spaces. So we'll draw some in there in orange. All right, I think that's pretty good. And let's label one of these. So what are the names of these? Whenever we see um, bone, a big thing, a big word root is os for bone. And these bone cells are called osteocytes. So there's an osteocyte and um, there are actually three different types of bone cells. And so let's make a little um, box up here just to like 
discuss those bone cells. And I like to put numbers on stuff so we remember if our list is complete. So these are our three bone cells. One, two, three. All of them have their name to start with osteo. And the first one is called an osteoblast. And I put that B in orange because it's gonna help us remember what osteoblasts do. Osteoblasts are the bone builders. The next one that we have is our osteocytes. And those we just met when we drew them in the lamellae and canaliculi over here. And I put site in orange because these bone cells, what they do is they oversee, get it, see in sites, they oversee mature bone. So osteocytes just kind of like they maintain a mature bone that's kind of built already. And the last one we have is called an osteoclast. The job of osteoclast is they are involved in bone resorption. And another way you can think about that is um, for bone, like it resorbs bone, so it breaks down bone, and we could say that's collapse. It's a little bit of a stretch, but that can help us kind of remember that stuff right there. All right, so those are our three types of bone cells. Well, let's get back over here and look at this microscopic um, bone anatomy. All right, so we've got to get nutrients to all of these osteocytes. And we have our central canals that have blood vessels and nerve tissue in them. And the blood vessels got to get from our medullary cavity to all of these central canals. And so I want to draw um, blood vessels in our medullary cavity over here. All right, so here's a big old beautiful red artery. And here's a blue vein. And those will actually break off and penetrate into, into the bone. And each of these central canals, it's not just on the surface, those central canals will go all the way down. And so this central canal would go down like this, and it's gonna join up with a canal that's going sideways. So we've got our up, up and down canals called our central canals. And then we've got some sideways canals as well. So let's draw this central canal going down into the bone and it's gonna connect with this sideways canal. Like that. And then these blood vessels are gonna navigate through all of this part of the bone. So there's our vein, and here's our arteries, like that. So we've got our central canals, and then these sideways canals actually have a name that's different, and they're called perforating perforating canals. So those perforating canals connect central canals. Perforating canals, central canals. All right, and then of course, like around those central canals, we'd have our, we'd have our lamellae rings going all the way down here. And those would be, those lamellae would be connected by canaliculi. So 
we'll draw those in and let's draw in some more osteocytes in orange so they could still be living in here as well and getting nutrients so that they can help um, build bone and break down bone as needed. All right, so um, let's think about the pathway that those nutrients um, follow. So if you were an oxygen molecule that had to get to an osteocyte, what would be that pathway? And this can help us remember those structures. So an oxygen molecule would be in the medullary cavity. in an artery, and then it would have to take a perforating canal to get into the bone, and then go up through a central canal and next, now it's up here, but it still needs to get to the osteocyte over there. So then it would have to take um, it would have to take a canaliculi to scooch over one lamella. So then it would get to a lamella and then finally into an osteocyte. So by sequencing these structures, that can kind of like help us manage them, help us remember them. All right, check that out. That's starting to look really good. This is all of the anatomy that I wanna cover on here for gross bone anatomy and microscopic bone anatomy. But now I wanna cover a little bit of physiology in our four panels at the bottom. So this is gonna be our physiology. What are the main functions of bones? Well, obviously when people think about bones in the skeletal system, they think about how the bones provide support and shape to the body and your bones actually help protect your soft tissues protect soft tissues and like some of those are really obvious right so like your ribs we think about our ribs and actually your shoulders your shoulder blades your scapulae those bones help protect like your lungs and your heart. And people think of the skull all the time as well in this role because that protects your brain. But also your skull protects your eyeballs too and protects the delicate structure of your ears. And then we've got our pelvis or our hips and that helps protect our abdomen and reproductive organs. The ovaries of the female are actually like attached to the hips. It's pretty cool and we'll learn about that later on. Your skeletal system is involved in movement and mainly because there's muscle attachment. So muscles um, attach to bones with tendons, right? And that happens at the periosteum. And our bones have all of these twists and turns on them called, we're gonna call them bone markings. And those shapes provide extra surface area for attachment of muscles to bones and bones to each other. And the other thing um, with movement that we talked about here is we have our articular cartilage. So bones are efficient at their um, function of helping movement because they have the specialized structure of articular cartilage and articular cartilage is really smooth to help reduce friction and um, absorb shock and articular cartilage is located at the ends of bones where those bones are gonna be contacting each other and moving. All right, let's move along. Next, we have the function of hematopoiesis. 
and that's the formation of blood cells. So red blood cells. Form in red bone marrow. All right, and that is in spongy bone. So spongy bone has those gaps that allow red bone marrow to sit in there as a good site of red blood cell formation. And these last two panels I wanna use for uh, homeostasis here. So we've got blood calcium homeostasis. All right, so we're gonna use, um, we're gonna use our homeostatic mechanisms here. So we'll say this one is the set point and what happens when blood calcium is too high. And then we'll do um, another one over here where the set point is up here. and the blood calcium is too low. So let's start over here, and it's probably helpful for a good review to just go stimulus, receptor, control center, effector, and uh, response. And the same over here, set point, stimulus, receptor, control center, we'll write it up here. Ah. Effector and response. Boy, that's not so much space there, Dr. Wallace. Okay. So let's start this one. We said our stimulus is going to be when blood calcium is too high. And so that means the response is going to be to return blood calcium to normal. How does that work? Well, cells in your thyroid gland are constantly monitoring your blood calcium level. And they also act as the control center as well. So that makes this a little bit easier um, to manage. And when blood calcium is too high, the thyroid gland secretes a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin. Calcitonin signals to the effector structure, which is our osteoblasts. And when osteoblasts get the signal of calci calcitonin, they take calcium out of the blood and store that in the bone by building some new bone. Once the osteoblasts take that calcium out of the blood, that means the calcium is going to go down in the blood back to our set point, which, um, if it helps you at all, is about nine milligrams per deciliter, but you don't have to memorize that. So this is when blood calcium is too high. When blood calcium is too low, uh, where do we wanna put that? Let's put that over here, too low. So our stimulus is going to be too low of blood calcium. That means our response is gonna be returning that blood calcium back to normal. Our receptor, this can be a little bit confusing. So it's a different gland that is the parathyroid gland. We're going to have to work at this a little bit to get that down. When is the thyroid and when is the parathyroid? Anyway, parathyroid gland measuring our um, blood calcium. But the good news is that the parathyroid gland also acts as the control center. And when blood calcium is too low, the parathyroid gland releases a hormone 
called parathyroid hormone or PTH, parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone acts on the opposite cells, our osteoclasts. So what osteoclasts are gonna do? Remember up here, we said it's bone resorption or collapsing bone. And osteoclasts are gonna break down bone and release that calcium that's stored in the bone um, to the blood. And that's it. So now we've got a lot of our information about anatomy and physiology of bones all in one nice organized place. Give yourself a pat on the back because this sheet is looking awesome and it's gonna be really helpful for you.